Today's episode is brought to you by the Daily Gardener Friday Newsletter. You can sign up for the newsletter over at thedailygardener.org. Hi there, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, a podcast about garden history and literature. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and today is May 2nd. Today in garden history, we celebrate the birthday of Friedrich von Hardenberg, whose pen name was Novalis. He was a German romantic poet and philosopher, and he was born on this day, May 2nd in 1772. Well, Friedrich's pen name was a nod to his 12th century farming ancestors who called themselves the Novali, which translates to people who cultivate the land. And Friedrich's first work under his pen name was called Blutenstaub, which means pollen. And it was in this book named Pollen that Novalis advised his artistic friends to be prolific in their work. He wrote, Friends, the soil is poor. We must scatter seed abundantly for even a modest harvest. Novalis is remembered most today for his unfinished work, Henry von Offerding, A Romance. Now, this work resulted in a nickname for Novalis as the Poet of the Blue Flower. Henry von Offerding was a fabled poet from the 13th century, and in Novalis's story, his romantic yearning was symbolized in his love for a blue flower, which Novalis later revealed was inspired by a heliotrope. For centuries, Novalis has been seen primarily as a love-struck poet who mourned the death of his first love, Sophie, only to be reunited with her in heaven after he too succumbed to the white plague or tuberculosis. Today, blue flowers remain a symbol of desire and a striving for the unreachable. They also represent humanity's connection with nature, a rare and fragile relationship. Today, blue flowers remain among the most coveted color of blossoms for gardeners, as in the Himalayan blue poppy, the delphinium, the cornflower, and the coveted forget-me-not. In Henry von Offerding, Novalis wrote these words, I care not for wealth and riches, but that blue flower I do long to see. It haunts me, and I can think and dream of nothing else. And it was on this day, May 2nd in 1853, that the English nurseryman, cactus collector, and jeweler Frederick Arthur Walton was born. Born in Birmingham, England, Frederick owned one of the largest private cactus collections in England, and he actually started a cactus nursery called The Friary. He also created and edited The Cactus Journal, a monthly journal devoted exclusively to cacti and other succulent plants. It ran for 24 issues. Frederick also founded the very first cactus society in England in 1895. In 1899, after he was retired from the jewelry business, Frederick traveled to America and Mexico. It was something that had been on his bucket list, and he wrote these words about his trip. On January 7, 1899, I took the train to Kansas City, then through New Mexico, and arrived at San Bernardino, California, where I met Andrew Halstead Alverson, a very enthusiastic cactus collector, and he took me out into the desert, and for the first time in my life, I was in the midst of wild cacti. Well, the trip was the adventure of a lifetime for Frederick. He battled snakes, scorpions, pumas, centipedes, and the harsh desert sun in an exploration of cactus country that covered over 20,000 miles. Now, today, Frederick is a bit of an enigma. In January of 1900, for unknown reasons, Frederick's Cactus Journal and the Cactus Society abruptly ended. There was mention in the final issues of the Cactus Journal that he was exploring the creation of a daffodil journal, but it was never printed. At the turn of the century, European gardeners outside of Germany had no real interest in cactus or succulents, and that interest would not be rekindled until the 1930s. 
And so, in 1905, Frederick's health was waning, and he sold his nursery. He died in 1922. And it was on this day, May 2nd in 1858, that the poet, teacher, abolitionist, and writer Charlotte Fortin started writing her poem called To a Beloved Friend. Charlotte was friends with a young woman named Sarah Cassie Smith, and she'd actually lived with the Smith family while attending school. In 1856, Charlotte became Salem State's first African-American graduate. Sarah and Charlotte spent a lot of time together in the years that Charlotte lived with the Smith family. They shared a love for all flowers, and in the springtime, the young women made and received May baskets, and they both enjoyed spring nosegays, or little bouquets. Once when Charlotte's teacher gave her a little bouquet, Charlotte wrote in her diary these words, "'Your voiceless lips, dear flowers,' Are living preachers. And the day before this day in 1858, or May 1st, Charlotte found herself homesick for Salem and for her friend Sarah. She disliked the noisy city life that she found herself in in Philadelphia, and she also confronted greater restrictions on her activities as an African American living in the city of brotherly love before the Civil War. Charlotte had even noted in her diary that she had been, quote, refused at two ice cream salons. And so when Sarah's bouquet arrived on May 1st, Charlotte quickly interpreted the meaning of each flower according to floriography or the language of flowers. It was a common way for people to communicate in the 1800s. Sarah's hand-picked Mayflowers symbolized welcome. The little violets represented constant friendship, and the delicate columbine was a reference to separation. The overall message of friendship and love across the miles of separation was received loud and clear. And from her diary, we know that the bouquet lifted Charlotte's mood and inspired her poem called to a beloved friend. And it was on this day, May 2nd, in 1923, that Robert Frost's poem, Our Singing Strength, was first published in the New Republic. The poem begins this way. It snowed in spring on earth, so dry and warm. The flakes could find no landing place to form. Hordes spent themselves to make it wet and cold and still they failed of any lasting hold. They made no white impressions on the black. They disappeared as if earth had sent them back. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, The Land Gardeners by Bridget Elworthy and Henrietta Courtauld. This book came out in 2020, and the subtitle is cut flowers. Well, let me begin by setting the table for you because that's exactly what the cover of this book looks like. You've got a table with a beautiful tablecloth and then a variety of porcelain vases on the table, all different sizes and shapes. And then behind that, you have a gallery of botanical art and then resting on the table are cut tulips, all kinds of tulips, parrot tulips, beautiful tulips. And then in two of the vases are different arrangements of these wonderful, fresh-picked tulips. And it's just an absolutely stunning cover. And by the way, this is a five-star book on Amazon as well. Now, together, Bridget and Henrietta are English gardeners, and they established a firm that they call Land Gardeners. And so the book is a reference to their work, as well as their shared passion, which is, of course, flowers. So in the real world, the Land Gardeners is a cut flower operation. And in the book, The Land Gardeners provides everything you need to know to set up your own cut flower garden and then everything that comes after, including gathering the flowers and even arranging. Vogue was a fan of this book. They said, a peek into their blossom-filled world, the book reads like a meander through their tumbling English gardens. The Sunday Times said it was one of the best gardening books of the year. And the Oregonian said, 
packed with ideas and inspiration, passion, and beauty. This large size hardcover book is filled with stellar photographs that will also inspire you to display a vase filled with flowers that you grew and arranged yourself. This book is a big one. It's almost five pounds, 381 pages of cut flowers from the garden to the vase. You can get a copy of The Land Gardeners by Bridget Elworthy and Henrietta Courtauld and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $23. Great book. Finally, we end the show today with a botanic spark that celebrates the birthday of the Irish botanist and explorer Norman Bohr, who was born on this day, May 2nd in 1893. Norman was awarded the Linnaean Medal back in 1962, and he also served as an assistant director at Kew. His wife, Eleanor, accompanied him to Assam and Tibet, and then wrote a fabulous book called The Adventures of a Botanist's Wife, a book I happen to own multiple copies of. I love the cover, and it's a favorite of mine. In 1952, the newspaper in Melbourne, Australia, featured Eleanor's book in an article called On Top of the World, and here's what it said. Mrs. Bohr had expected to share exciting plant discoveries and at least to give her name to a rare orchid. Instead, she found her husband was a specialist in grasses, and it was a new species of grass, extremely rare, but to her looking no more than a, quote, mangy bit of fur that finally bore her name. Once on a mountain, stepping from mist and snow, they saw below them a blaze of rhododendrons and magnolias, and in their camp that night, they burned rhododendron logs. Well, their mountain trips were often dangerous. The Rupa Bridge was especially terrifying, with only strands of cane for a foothold and tall hoops set a yard apart for the hands to grip. Can you imagine? Well, more menacing than the cane bridges and the cliff tracks were the insects. Wild animals were not alarming, but the hornets, centipedes, horseflies, damdems, and above all, the leeches made camping in the jungle foothills a nightmare. One reviewer wrote, Here is a story with the charm and simplicity of a life spent in the foothills of the Himalayas, where Eleanor Bohr and her botanist husband tramp through jungle terrain, establishing friendly relations with hill tribes and villagers, discovering the enchantments of mysterious undergrowth, and carrying with them the domestic problems of household pets and family happenings. Their years in the jungle are those of a true traveler. It's a great book. Well, that's it for today's show. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And just a reminder that you have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for listeners of the show. The next time you're over at Facebook, just search for Daily Gardener Community, where you'd search for a friend and then request to join. And if you'd like more of The Daily Gardener, you can subscribe to the newsletter over at thedailygardener.org. And don't forget that you can also show your support for the show by using the Buy Me a Coffee link over at the website or in today's show notes. This is Jennifer Ebling. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. Every day.